Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Western Spirit. Today, we have a very special guest. It's someone that I've gotten to know, uh, not personally, obviously, but from afar, reading his stuff lately. Um, one of the most more interesting things that our guest wrote um, was an article in the Harvard Crimson. And so I'll just explain who our guest is. Professor Randall Kennedy. Randall Kennedy is the Michael R. Klein Professor um, at Harvard Law School, and he is someone who has been working at Harvard for the past 40 years, uh, written lots of books, articles. Um, he's a distinguished um, law scholar, and he wrote an article not too long ago in the Harvard Crimson, uh, which was titled, Mandatory DEI Statements Are Ideological Pledges of Allegiance, and It's Time to Abandon Them. Um, and I know, so first of all, let me say hello to Professor Kennedy. So it's very good to be with you all the way here from Israel. The time difference is sometimes tough, but I'm happy we got it done. Thank um, you so very it's much. good to be with you. On. So I guess I'm not, I don't think I should read from your article because I think it's better if you just tell us the, um, the main points and then we'll maybe discuss them. So maybe just give us, first of all, in Israel, I think we have less of a DEI issue even because usually things happen a decade later. And this is something that's new for America, even it's uh, it's relatively new. So here we don't really have it. So maybe for the Israeli audience, explain to us what is the I that you're talking about? OK, well, in many institutions of higher education in the in the United States. Um, <clears throat> there are uh, programs, diversity, equity, inclusion. At my institution at Harvard, it's called Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Belonging. And these are programs that attempt to make these institutions um, welcoming to people who have historically been excluded or marginalized. So mm -hmm. these are programs that attempt to make these institutions more welcoming to racial minorities, um, to women. Uh, to uh, gay people, to lesbians, to people who have been historically marginalized in American life. And um, these institutions try to um, bring in people who have been, again, historically excluded. And when they bring, and when people are brought in, when people do come in, uh, these are programs that attempt to make them, like I say, more more welcome. Yeah. Uh, try to assuage any anxieties that people uh, might have. These are programs that attempt to uh, lessen prejudice against marginalized groups. Again, in an effort to make these institutions more welcoming. Institutions. Up until now, it sounds very good. Where are the actual problems that you're talking about? Yes. Well, actually, I think that uh, I think that the 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 diversity, equity, inclusion and belonging programs, they come from a, a good place. The 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 aspiration, in my view, is a quite good aspiration, a noble aspiration. The problem. The problem is that um, anytime any bureaucracy gets power, uh, there's a potential problem. Mm -hmm. So here we have people that want to make uh, institutions more welcoming. They want to um, they want to uh, dampen prejudice. They want to advance the agenda of uh, social equality. Those are all good things. But then, you know, how do you go about doing that? And one of the things that has happened in America is that these uh, institutions have gotten a bit of power. Are they all powerful? No, of course not. But they do have some degree of power. And uh, when people get some degree of power, they have a, a tendency to overreach. They have a tendency to want to compel other people to go along with their program. Uh, they leave the domain of persuasion and enter the domain of coercion. Yeah. And here's where we get to mandatory diversity uh, statements. So in the United States, at many institutions, if you want to be, uh, if you want to be hired as a, um, a professor, 
or if you want to be promoted as a professor, what happens? Well, you're asked to give to the authorities your writings. You're asked to tell, well, you know, what, you know, what's your, what's your scholarly mission? What do you want to accomplish? Uh, you're asked to have people send letters of recommendation on your behalf. All that seems perfectly sensible. But then, in the past, I'd say probably decade, many institutions have asked for something else. They've asked for a diversity statement in which you are expected to announce your fealty, your allegiance to the diversity, equity, and inclusion program. It's Could you give us an example what they actually ask you? Yeah. So they, they actually ask you, they say, well, w what's your understanding of DEI and how will you advance DEI in your scholarship and in your teaching? Hmm. Well, how will I advance DEI? That, that assumes that I agree with DEI. How will I advance it? So as soon as you, as soon as you sort of um, submit, right. and I use the word submit advisedly, as soon as you submit your statement, you are signaling that you are on board with the whole DEI program. I want and to stop it, you there one second before yeah. you continue. Let's sure. say, let's say I don't agree with it. Let's say I am a I'll say um someone I assume you agree with these the goals of the DEI. It sounds like you agree with them, but let's say you don't. Mm -hmm. Meaning let's say you're someone who's more of um I guess maybe I'm there. Someone who says I want more of a meritocratic and I'm mm -hmm. against a system and I'm against um, affirmative action, let's say, mm -hmm. or it, uh, against it in a more widespread way that it is today. And mm -hmm. I want to work and convince people like Professor Kennedy to, and we'll have a discussion. That's what the whole point of the university system is, where people come from different ideological backgrounds. And I write on this DEI form that I'm not for DEI. Yeah, so well, would they accept me to work? Uh, in, many, in many places, no. In many places, you write what you just said, and you will then get a very nice letter about, <laughs> you know, a week later saying, thank you very much for your application. Uh, we have decided uh, to go in a different direction. You, in many yeah. places, you, if you write what you just said, no, you will not get the job. And of course, that's, you know, as far as I'm concerned, part of the problem. You and I probably do disagree right. ideologically about this, perhaps other things, but, um, you know, university life should be um, open, it should be cosmopolitan, and above all, it should be, we should be searching for people who are expert in their field and right. who have something to offer in a you know in a scholarly way you by the way writing what you just said you would not get a job if you were applying for an english position you would not get a job if you were applying for a, a position as a physicist or a chemist you would be out and there are many people who view this as a type of uh, enforced conformity? I I view it that way. Right. Uh, it's 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 coercion in a velvet glove, and I think that it is. Um, I think that it is uh, a threat to academic freedom. What I say to my friends, for instance, is I say, you know, I've had many arguments with friends about this, and I say to my friends. Just suppose the universities demanded uh, a, a, a statement and they asked the question, how in your scholarship and teaching do you plan to advance the ethos of make America great again? <laughs> you, yeah. you, we, we went, we, you know, in a there minute. Will be protests. Oh, no. Yeah. You know, we can't have that. That's terrible. That is. That is enlisting us into a program that we don't like. Well, and it is exactly. Yeah. 
So in any event, that's why I'm against the DEI. But could I just – I want to ask two things about the actual result of that. Number one, it would obviously make people who said what I said not get in. But number two, I think, and more scary is that it makes people lie. Yes. Right? It would make people lie – if they knew that if they had certain opinions, they wouldn't get accepted or they wouldn't get promoted, they would keep their opinions to themselves. And you have sort of like – a society, sort of an internal society or internal culture of people being silenced, meaning they have certain opinions, but they won't they won't give them uh, an outlet. So, and that's dangerous in and of itself, right? Because people feel that they get they're closed up. Um, you're correct. One of the reasons why DEI statements have triggered such tremendous resentment, and they have. And frankly, I think the DEI statements, mandatory DEI statements, are going to be erased from a much of university life because, you know, academics, even if they even if they agree with a program, they don't want to be quizzed about it. They don't want to be in the you know have the feeling that they have to agree. They don't want to be coerced. So, number one, you're right. There are people who feel tremendous resentment because they feel that they cannot be, they cannot honestly share their beliefs. There's something else going on. Um, you can, you know, you can, you can go to your computer right now and go online and type in DEI statements. What you will find is a, a, an industry of consultants an industry of people who uh, are printing up these things, coaching uh, you. You know, you can you can order DEI statements. It is tra- It is it is it's creating uh, insincerity. It is giving rise to faux statements, and of course, that's not good for uh, academic life. Okay, I want to ask you, and I agree with you, but uh, uh, I agree with you on the, I think we agree on the way it's being handled and maybe not on the um, actual reasoning behind it. So mm-hmm. I think, and I think it's like you said, it's, it's, it's good that we're having, that we have these discussions, whereas if I would have write, written what I said, we wouldn't have been able to have them if I want to come to Harvard, for example, and I would be eligible other than that, that mm-hmm. uh, not any university, I'm not talking about specifically Harvard, I guess. Um, my second question was about that I wrote to talk to you was about affirmative action in and of itself. Mm-hmm. So putting aside, aside DI, which is a new phenomenon, we said it's about the last decade. Um, affirmative action is something that has, I guess, different opinions over the years about what, first of all, is it fair? Mm-hmm. And you've written, I think about also stuff that has to do with affirmative action. Is it fair as number one? And is it good for overall society? Meaning, are we getting the best and the brightest or are we losing them in order to bring up certain groups? How do you yeah. look at this issue? Yeah. Um, I, I have written about affirmative action. I wrote a book about affirmative action yeah. called For Discrimination. And my, I, I defend affirmative action. Affirmative action is basically an effort to reach a helping hand out to um, sectors of the society that have been historically marginalized. Uh, Blacks come to mind in particular. African Americans are sort of the the paradigmatic group, but there are other groups uh, as, as, as well. And in my view, that's a perfectly um, defensible uh, thing to to do again, one has to be careful about you know how it's done. Obviously, you can have stupid affirmative action if you um, if you over promote people, if you put people in a position in which they're going to fail. Well, that's bad. That's bad for them. That's bad for the institution. On the other hand, let's imagine a um, a, a situation. In which you have a uh, uh, imagine a situation in which you have an institution that has never before had a uh, you know a, a black student period, mm-hmm. and this institution says, "Gosh, you know we 
we that that makes us we don't we don't like that we we and and let's suppose by the way that the institution has never um gone out of its way to exclude black students it just hasn't had black students the institution says we don't like that we don't think that's a good thing uh we are a uh, wealthy institution we are a prestigious institution we want to do our bit to help america overcome its racial its 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 um legacy of racial oppression we're going to make a special effort to bring in black students and let's suppose that that special effort is simply to advertise let's suppose that they put in the newspaper a hey, and our you know we are we are open to all comers including black students we haven't had black students but we really welcome black students now that's a you could say that's a type of affirmative action right that's that is doing something special for prospective black students that's not being done for white students now many people including people who oppose affirmative action in the United States would view that as tolerable. They would say, oh, okay, with that. What people really don't like, here's where, here's where it gets controversial in America. What they don't like is, okay, you know, advertising, outreach, okay. But then you have stronger forms of affirmative action. You have an let's suppose you have 100 seats in your institution. It's very competitive, and you ha it comes down to you know you, you have a white candidate. The white candidate scored let's say 800 on a standardized test. You have a black candidate who scored let's say 700 on the standardized test. Both of them did, you know, quite well. But the white candidate clearly did better than the black candidate. Under uh, affirmative action, as it has been practiced in the United States for the past, you know, let's say 40, 50 years, there are many institutions that under those circumstances might very well prefer the black student. Why? Well you know, sort of reparative justice. We're doing our bit to try to yeah. repair the legacy of past oppression. So-called diversity. We want to have the black student in our, in our institution because we think that uh, uh, everybody will benefit uh, by hearing from the black student. Let's suppose you're in some class talking about, you know, um, police policy in the United right. States. Um, and let's suppose you have a class and it's mainly white kids. The white kids have had a certain experience with the police, but then you have some black kids there and the black kids say, oh, our experience has been a lot different. Let me tell you about this. Let me tell you about this. Let me tell you about this. The idea is, well, that's a type of learning that will be useful in the academic uh, environment. Those are, those, are, those are two reasons. There, 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 there are others as well. But those but you, are reasons that, you know, I, I find okay so long as, again, one is sensible. Would you agree that, may, maybe not agree, but what do you think about people who say that, yes, maybe in social studies or let's say the, um, I don't know, like law or um, poli sci, whatever, that's okay. But when you get to things that are life-threatening, like you mentioned physicians or... Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, all the different uh, uh, airplanes, p p uh, pilots. Do you mm -hmm. think, let's say we have one student, like you said, the white student has an 800 on his test, the black student has a 700, or maybe not white and black, even a poor student, someone who comes from a poor background that you want to uplift him, mm -hmm. and the rich student who comes from a richer background has an 800. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, we all want the surgeon who operates on us to be the best of the best. Mm -hmm. Do you think that in those fields, the ones that are actually life-threatening, if they get it wrong, there should be less of affirmative action? I think in all fields, we should have very high standards. I certainly, before, before I go into the operating room, I certainly want to have 
total assurance that my surgeon knows what he or she is doing. <laughs> yeah. And so, again, I don't mind the idea of medical school. And for, in fact, the first, the first time that the United States Supreme Court grappled with affirmative action in full was a case called Bakke versus the University of California at Davis Medical School. And I don't mind the idea of the medical school having affirmative action to bring in people. At some point, however, there has to be full accountability. Yeah. Now, the thing is, and here's where critics of affirmative action, you know, a critic of affirmative action would say, listen, once the affirmative action ethos is unloosed, it permeates everything. And so there are people who would say, um, you know, Kennedy, you might, you might say to the medical school, we want you to hold everybody accountable before they get out. But once this is let loose in the medical school, the medical school is going to be under pressure to, um, you know, to, to graduate uh, students. Right. Who, under different circumstances, they might not feel pressure to graduate. Do am I concerned about that? Yeah, I'm concerned about that. I think that you know, again, we we need to be realistic. We we need to understand the uh, the dangers uh, that come with things. That you know, do, are there dangers that come with affirmative action? Yeah, there are dangers. Listen, you can see I'm black. Okay, I'm black. You can see it. Mm -hmm. On September 1st, when I go to, I teach contracts. When I go to my contracts class on that very first day, I know that there are a certain number of students who look at me, and they're not bad people. They're not bad people at all. But they look at me and they wonder to themselves, hmm, am I getting a real Harvard Law School professor, or am I getting a person who's good, but not, you know, not quite up to, you know, full Harvard Law School professor status? Why would they think that? Because people are getting enough affirmative action? Yes, because uh -huh. they, they think, that, again, uh, affirmative action, does affirmative action have a stigmatizing effect? To some degree, it does, of course. Mm -hmm. They're going to think, well, gosh, you know, we know that it's probably the case that Harvard Law School, like other places, you know, made a special effort to bring in racial minority uh, candidates. They probably made a special effort to bring right. in this guy, Kennedy. Even though you're there before the it all started pretty much, right? No, you're there no, 40 no, years. No. no. And in fact, no. And in fact, question. Have I been assisted in my career by affirmative action? Answer, yes. I, I, wow. I, I, I say that. And I say it, by the way, unashamedly. I say it openly. I think that my work, I certainly hope, I've certainly tried to make my work um, yeah. you know, substantiate my status. Other people have to come to their own conclusion on that. But my point is that affirmative action does have certain downsides. I realize that, but it is also has it has had upsides. Yes. The United States of America over the past 50 years has improved on the racial front in very important ways. And part of that improvement is attributable to affirmative action. I want to ask you one, by the way, that's one that maybe I'll ask you about later, just in general race relations, because we have it here in a different way, but it's interesting to learn about what's happening there. One question just about the fairness issue. Mm -hmm. When someone who is a white student who's applying to a university or to a job or wherever, mm -hmm. and he has the better grades or the better CV or whatever, mm -hmm. and then he knows that he was on the cusp of getting in, but mm -hmm. he didn't get in because an affirmative action uh, per, a student did get in. Mm -hmm. What do we say to him? How does yeah. society talk to these people? Yeah, I think that's a great question. 
And uh, there are a couple of things I would say to him uh, or her. Yeah. Uh, I'd say, you know, you are part of an ongoing enterprise called the United States of America. And part, and, and you get the benefits of that ongoing enterprise. Um, but you also have to pay, uh, you know, your share um, to deal with past problems in this enterprise. And one of the things, you as a white person, you know, you as a white person, you've been benefited a whole lot of ways, okay? You, it's, it's not like you started at the same, you know, on the same line as your black neighbor. No, one. you're white. You've, you've, you've been benefited in certain ways. That's, part, that's number one. And I think you should recognize that. Two, even if you had not been benefited, because, you know, white people, there are a lot of white people who really get riled up. You say white privilege and they want to fight you. So put that aside. Okay. I would say whether you've been benefited or not, the fact of the matter is America has had for a long time a race problem. You are now being asked in your own way to contribute to that. A white person then turns to me and says, well, yeah, but, you know, I didn't put your people in slavery. I didn't put your people in segregation. Maybe I can't, you know, my people, my people immigrated to the United States 20 years ago, and we didn't even know the language. Right. And what I say to that person is, I hear you. I understand you. But let me, let me give you an analogy and see if it has, you know, if it resonates with you anyway. During World War II, the United States of America put under detention on the West Coast of the United States, all people of Japanese ancestry, regardless of citizen, uh, citizenship. Mm -hmm. So if you were a citizen or you were a non-citizen, if you were a person of Japanese ancestry, you were put under a curfew, you were detained, and many people were sent to camps in America. Well, decades later, decades later, the United States government passed a law in which it apologized for that racist mistreatment of all people of Japanese ancestry. And the United States government also said, we are going to pay $20,000 to all living uh, heads of, you know, all living people who were, who were, who, who were burdened by that. Question. That money, I, you know, I'm a taxpayer in the United States. Um, I paid some of that. I was happy to pay some of that. Did my people put the, you know, people of Japanese ancestry under these curfews or under these detentions? No. Right. But I am part of the United States of America, and I view it as part of my responsibility you know, try as, as, as much as one reasonably can to make things right, including make thing, making things right with past racial wrongs. Meaning we have sort of, uh, what you're saying is that you think we have some sort of collective um, responsibility sometimes. Yes. Where you'll, you'll pay a price because of the collective what past, et cetera, et cetera. Yes. Um, I guess now, my... again, we have to be really careful. Uh, right. I'll just say, you know, one thing that's happened recently, you know, Harvard University was sued and lost in right. the Supreme, in the Court, Supreme of the Court. States. And the and one of the one of the one of the claims in that lawsuit uh, was was that people of Asian ancestry yeah. were being disadvantaged by uh, affirmative action. And you know, one of the things that's a problem or a difficulty in the United States, I shouldn't say a problem, a difficulty. The United States is a lot more diverse racially than it used to be. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, I'm about to turn 70 years old. When I, you know, when I was a kid, uh, the United States, you, know, you, had, you had, you know, black people, you had white people, 
And then you had a very small sliver of other people. Well, it's very different now. Yeah. And so the whole question of how do we fairly reckon with our racial past? How do we do things to help, let's say, black people, but not unduly disadvantage Latinos or not unduly disadvantage Asian American people? Right. That's a real issue, and we're grappling with it. And Professor Ken, one thing that I did see uh, is that the uh, I'm talking obviously from Israel um, and the Jewish um, community is uh, I grew up in Brooklyn, New York, so mm -hmm. uh, I came to Israel about 20 years ago. Um, but one thing that is interesting is that the number of Jewish students in elite universities has been going down steadily over the past decade or so, mm -hmm. and a lot of there, it has been growing a lot of resentment in the Jewish community about what we did talk about because a lot it can't be overstated that it is one student. It's a zero sum game a lot of times, mm -hmm. meaning that if you accept one student because of affirmative action, another student will be left out. Yes. So I'm not. It isn't. I think a um, anti-Semitic problem or a racial problem. It is some sort of way to get a balancing act that still hasn't gotten 100% to where it should be. Yeah. And I guess what you're saying here is, and what you're writing about and with the DEI and everything, is that we're trying to get to a better place. And we need to, in order to get there, we need to talk, which is one of the things that we spoke about in the beginning. Yes. I wanted to ask you one more thing about this whole subject is I was reading about um, getting ready to talk to you about Mar MLK, Martin Luther King, and one of his famous speeches was, I have a dream that basically the gist of the speech is that everyone will be a, basically a colorblind society. And I think we have, we're now in a place where it seems to me that a lot of, in, we're not even looking for a colorblind society, meaning you'll have um, segregated uh, dorms in some of these places for black students or for Asian students. You'll have um, fraternities from different um, races, et cetera, et cetera, and different days for race groups. How do you see this, I guess, shift in the way we look at race relations? Yeah. Meaning it used to be that when we talked about, uh, you know, getting out of our racist past, that everyone would be the same. And now we're sort of looking at and saying, we'll treat you the same, but we'll also recognize your differences. Yeah. Well, you've put your finger on a, a huge and very deep problem. The fact of the matter is, um, and this is not talked about enough in the United States. In the United States, it's not altogether clear what we want. Yeah. So, for instance, you, 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 you talked about Martin Luther King's great I Have a Dream speech. I love that speech. I think it's a yes. great speech. I embrace that speech. But, you know, in many parts of the United States today, there are people, in particular a lot of young people, who scoff at that speech. Yes. They don't view it as a great speech. And, by the way, you use the term colorblind. Uh, there are a lot of places now where you say colorblind, you say that you're in favor of a colorblind America, in many places that is coded as conservative. It may be even coded as racist. Yes. Um, now, even in 1963, when Martin Luther King Jr. gave that great speech, you know, there was conflict then over what we wanted. I mean, you know, there was Martin Luther King Jr., but then there was Malcolm X. Uh, and people in America have been constantly grappling with, you know, what do we really want? And you know how you can tell it? You can tell it in the way in which we have various competing metaphors. Right. So one metaphor is, you know, colorblind America. And some people embrace that idea. We're all essentially the same. But there's some people who really don't like that. They say, well, gosh, you know, you say that, that's assimilation. We're going to lose our blackness, et cetera. And so you have competing metaphors. Some people talk about the rainbow, you know, the rainbow metaphor or the, the salad metaphor. Yeah. Um, and I think we're, we're searching for you know, what is it 
that we really want. Here's one for you. And I yeah. think that your audience will really appreciate this. And this is a very complex, this is a, this has become a, a controversial thing. In many places, you'll hear people say, well, we want, we want something that looks like America. We want a cabinet that looks like America. We want a student body that looks yeah. like America. We want a faculty that looks like America. Well, you know, frankly, if you are, if you are part of a minority like I am, where you have, let's say, you know, 10%, well, you know, if if you if 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 you've got a you know ten percent, well, you're gonna you're gonna get some people with ten percent. Just suppose, however, you are part of a group that has a very small percent. Just suppose you're with a group, you know, Asian Americans, let's say, three percent. Well, what the heck? Uh, if you're saying looks like America, they may be lost. Right. This is also something that I think concerns. Uh, Jewish Americans, you know, mm -hmm. Jewish Americans, Jewish Americans, that's a, that's a, you know, small, very small. And so if you start talking this representational talk, we want something that looks like America. Well, if you start saying they're not enough, a few more sentences and you start to talk about they're too many. And there's where, well, what do you it's mean? Dangerous. Are yeah. we going to put a cap? Are we going to put a, you know, we're we going to put a limit? Those are the sorts of things that people are trying to struggle with in America. Well, Professor Kennedy, there used to be a, a limit on Jews in universities in America Absolutely. in the past. So That's right. uh, we're making maybe full circle in some of these places. I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think, no. In all but seriousness, that's the I danger, think. I mean. Yeah, there's, I mean, you know, uh, Columbia University has been in the news quite a yeah. lot. Uh, Columbia University didn't hire Jews for to its uh, to most parts of its faculty until after the Second World War. Yeah. So I mean, we're not talking about something you know in medieval times. We're talking about something in the you know in the mm -hmm. in, in the memory of people who are still alive. I wanted to ask you also about what we've been seeing over a ba I think basically all the campuses in America, and not only campuses. I was here on a I am still here, but I was obviously here on October 7th and ever since. Um, mm -hmm. Just if people are listening because of you, so they're from America. And I'd say that we'll obviously transcribe the interview, so it'll be a, captioned. But I'll just say that it was a very, it's a very scary period here. Um, and I think in a lot of senses, one of the reasons why it's so scary is not just the actual attack, but the thought that we're alone in the world as a, as an, as a people. Um, and when we look at the U.S., which used to have, quote unquote, our back, we see these huge protests and some of them are very, um, I would, I think we can, I think I can say at least some of them are anti-Semitic. Others are le totally legitimate. Um, but I guess my question is, first of all, what happened? Because when I was in growing up in New York in the, I would say the early 2000s, there was the second intifada in Israel, and we had protests even next to our house. And I grew up; my aunt lives next to NYU, so we would have protests, but they were much smaller and a lot less, I would say, crazy in quotes. Just the the way, the velocity of them, and the way they were today, they're growing and spreading. Um, so my first question is just the sense of. I know this is not your profession of studying protests. What do you think? Number one is happening here and number two it seems like a lot of this protest is coming out of an ideology or way of looking at the world which sees everything in a person who's the oppressed and the oppressor meaning that if you look at it it's very complex what's happening here i'd be the first to say but if your whole world view is that they're always an oppressed and there's always an oppressor you'll see the stronger party the one who has the big military is the bad and the smaller party who's obviously less sophisticated as the good, even though it might not be true. But that's, I think, the, the main thing that I get from seeing what they're saying. Do you think there's any veracity to what I'm saying here? Yeah, I think there's some veracity to what you're saying. And now, you know, let, let, let me preface my comments by saying, you know, by underlining, uh, I'm not altogether, you know, I'm not altogether clear yeah. about all that's been going on. I mean, I'm, I'm on a campus. 
Uh, lot, lots been happening. There's been a tremendous amount of uh, action. There's been a tremendous amount of information that has been, uh, uh, you know, disseminated. Um, I read, I talk with my colleagues, I try to make sense of things. I don't think that I have, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm not a master of the situation by any means. I think that there are a lot of different things going on. Um, I mean, among them, among them, I think a large part of the protests, the student protests in the United States, a large part is a legitimate, in my view, a legitimate, um, uh, a legitimate um, exercise of free speech, of protest. Well, not just exercise of free speech. Not just they exercise. have legitimate claims, you mean? Yes, I think that I think that people, I think that there are a lot of people, including students, who believe that uh, Israel, that the government mm -hmm. of Israel, that the govern, the current government of Israel, has uh, been has acted in response to the terrible attack of October seventh. That the that the the current government of Israel has acted in a way that uh, cannot be suitably justified. I think that there are a lot of people who believe that, yeah. and I think that there is, you know, my own view, I think there is good cause to believe that. Mm -hmm. That's not all that's going on, though, of course. Yeah. Uh, that's not all that's going on. Uh, another thing that's going on uh, is, you know, um, fashion i think that you know we especially i mean when you're talking about people and protests and campuses and young people you know uh there's a certain way there's a certain amount of you know what are the cool kids doing what <laughs> you know what is you know what's the fashion what's and 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 and, and, and at this particular moment at this particular moment um I think that the social forces that uh, are extremely critical of the government of Israel uh, has the edge on fashion, to tell you yeah. the truth. And part of the reason that they have the edge on fashion has to do with um, uh, politics in the United States. You know, the right wing in the United States, the right wing of the Republican Party in the United States, has gotten into this controversy that we are discussing. Right. The right wing of the United States has clearly determined that it will be to its political electoral advantage to um to 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 demonize to absolutely demonize criticism of Israel and i think that that has in turn had the effect of um of giving actually more fashion points to people who actually do Partially criticize Israel. So I, I think a lot of things are going. What on. you're saying is that I found that the fact that because university students do tend to be more to the left, you know, always yeah. young people tend to be more to the left. Um, some of them, in turn, when they get older, become more to the right, and that's how things play out. But what you're saying is that because of that. And the fact that the right in America has taken the opposite stance of these protests to a, a very certain, very, I'd say serious degree we just had it here in israel stefanik she's here right now so yeah so what you're saying is that because she's here and she was the hearing with the uh, uh, presidents of universities and the whole thing it actually pushed a lot of people on the left to be more critical of israel and go to these protests more and more because it's become a political hot potato very much very much interesting uh, and and um 
you know, one, you know, now you, you um, anti-Semitism. Yeah. Is anti-Semitism part of this? Yes, it's part of this. Uh, you know, I, you know, you know, there's various sorts of anti-Semitism. Um, but is there anti-Semitism in this? Yes. Um, you know, you can't, you, you just, you know, you listen to people, right. you read between the lines, you know, just, just at the basic level of, uh, are the sentiments, are the feelings, are the anxieties, uh, Jewish people being taken into account as much as the sentiments, the anxieties, the feelings of other people. Uh, answer in many in 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 in, in you know in in, in uh, lots of instances, the answer is no. Yeah, and it seems to me that that needs to be taken very seriously, and that is a big problem. It's also a problem, however. It's also a problem when feelings of victimhood are weaponized and are used to advance a political program. So, uh, you know, five years ago in the so-called George Floyd moment, when there was lots of turmoil in the United States over the killings of uh, black men by police, during that <clears throat> turmoil, uh, there were black people again, at, at universities, including at universities, who made very large claims. Yeah. Uh, there's been no change in American life. Uh, racism is rampant. Uh, you know, these universities are shot through and through with racism. Yeah. And my response was, that's not true. Is there racism in the United States? Oh, yes, there's racism in the United States. Yes, there is. But let's keep things in perspective. Uh, you know, Princeton University, Harvard University, uh, it's not, there's not rampant racism there. The KKK is not walking around in hats at Harvard. Not at all. <laughs> and by the way, I would say, you know, and I have written recently, and, you know, some of my friends really disagree with me about this. I would say the same, I would say, at least on my campus, at Harvard University, because Harvard's gotten a lot of attention. Right. There are people that say, for instance, that there's, you know, rampant anti-Semitism at Harvard University. I don't believe that. Uh, when I heard that, my, you know, my antenna went, went way up. I've been looking into it. I've been talking with people. You know, I, again, I've been here 40 years. Um, I don't believe it. I think that some of the claims of anti-Semitism have been deployed strategically in order to um uh, in order to embarrass in order to humiliate in, in order to intimidate the authorities here and i don't think that's a good thing i think mm -hmm. that uh, groups blacks jews whoever uh tell the truth and you know uh and be accurate but strategic exaggeration, I think, is a is 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 a bad thing. Well, and I think I, that is part of what's say, going on. I would just say two things. Number one is that I don't really know about it, everything that's happening at Harvard, so I'll take your word. I would just say that I grew up, as I said before, in Brooklyn, New York. I grew up. I don't look like that, but I grew up in a Hasidic Jewish family, ultra orthodox. I used to have the hat, the jacket, the beard, the whole uniform. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not there anymore, as you can see, but, uh, <laughs> but where I grew up there, I mean, it's a community, so it, you can't make, you can't mistake the community is known. I grew up in Crown Heights. Mm -hmm. Um, and so there have been marches through the community there and right. the, I would just say that there's a reason if you're protesting against Israel or the Israeli government, you don't have to do it in front of a synagogue. Because when you do it in front of a synagogue, you're sending a message that links the Jewish place of worship to the government that you're protesting. Mm -hmm. And that's where it becomes, I think, anti-Semitic. Yeah. Where 
obviously I'm not talking about actual statements. That could be one thing. But when you're actually, their whole protest is protesting a synagogue or a Jewish community or a Jewish business where there has been instances. So I think when people are saying, so obviously every instance is different, but you do see this propping up in a way that does, I think should concern every American because you don't want that. No, I'm very concerned. So for instance, here, uh, there was a protest a couple of, uh, I think a week or two ago, in which a couple of hundred students marched to the home of the interim president of Harvard University, Alan Garber. I was totally against that. What was um, the reason know, for it? Uh, you, you, you can protest, you can, you can march, you can do various things, but going to somebody's house? Right. No, that, you know, again, people ought to be more disciplined. And again, I want to make one thing very clear. One thing that, I, that has bothered me very much because I, I've already indicated, I'm 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 very my, I'm quite critical on a of the variety of dimensions of the present Israeli government. Mm -hmm. uh, but I tell you what, if you send me something, if you send me a letter, and I've been sent many letters, I've signed some of them, but if I'm reading a letter that's you know being intensely that's being critical of the Israeli government. And there is not, you know, something in there that says, now hold it. You know, we're being we, you know, we 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 want this done, we want this done, we want this done, we're against this, we're against that, we're against the other. At some point, I want it made crystal clear that who, you know, we are not with Hamas. Yeah. <laughs> And I've been sort of surprised, I must say, there have been a couple of times just uh, about, this happened about a week ago, a letter was sent to me, and I was actually, you know, I was getting ready to sign it. You know, I was read through the letter, I, you know, I was getting ready to sign it. It was a letter that was protesting, uh, you know, some investigation of, 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 of people in the university. And I was getting ready to sign yeah. it, and then I said, oh, hold it. I, let me reread this letter. <laughs> And the letter said nothing about Hamas, nothing about the um, the real, you know, terrors that uh, Israelis, that Jews around the world, yeah, have lived with, and you know, and I, you know, I, 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 I said no, uh, uh, no. I and and there I must say I've been in discussions with people. I've been a little bit surprised. This has caught me up a little bit. I've been sort of surprised by the the unwillingness of people to say what you know it seems to me it should be very clear any decent-minded person it should be almost and of course and indeed um, if I'm in a conversation and someone is, you know, really, you know, really hesitant, then I'm, you know, I really, I, I find that quite alienating, actually. Professor Kennedy, I want to ask you one last issue that we mentioned before about race relations getting better in America. You said that race relations have been getting steadily better over time. Um, and I want to put that in a, like, just mention what you spoke about the george floyd issue mm -hmm. so a few years ago as you mentioned the george floyd the the video of his death and the way it happened and it was horrible goes viral the whole world sees it i was in israel we were watching it on our tvs we were seeing the protest it was during covid also so we had nothing else to do so we're watching it on tv um everybody was at least that I knew was in shock. And I come from a more, I guess, right wing background. So even there, people were horrified. And then from that place comes the Black Lives Matter movement. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe you agree with me that we have to make a distinction between people who are saying Black Lives Matter and the actual movement Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. And so my question to you is from a place that we, you said that race relations have been getting better to a place where there's a movement that's been getting traction and millions of dollars in, um, you know, donations calling for, for example, I saw you talking about this, like 
um, uh, defund the police, which became this big slogan, or uh, different district attorneys who are in the name of Black Lives Matter, not prosecuting violent offenders, et cetera, et cetera. What, what should we see? Where do you stand on all these things? First of all, um, I don't think I said that race relations in the United States are are, are always getting steadily right. better. The fact that what happens uh, is there's 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 two steps better, and then there's One a step side back. step, and then people there's a stumble. Sometimes <laughs> people fall down. Sometimes people go backwards. It's not a steady thing. Okay, but. You know, um, we just celebrated an important landmark in American life. Uh, on May 17th, uh, 2024, the United States um, commemorated the 70th anniversary of Brown versus Board of Education. That's the case in which the United States Supreme Court said that it was unconstitutional. It was intolerable for states to require people of different races to go to different schools. Yes. That, I'm 70 years old. So, you know, th this was, this, this case is sort of the, is, is, is in my lifetime. Um, we're, you know, the United States has changed considerably over these 70 years. Um, when I was born, you didn't have black people in the upper echelons of government right. at all. Uh, in my lifetime, I saw a black person who became president of the United States for eight years. As I speak with you today, the vice president of the United States is a black woman. The Secretary of Defense of the United States, and I, you know, I read in the newspaper. He come, he's the, you know, he comes representing the United States of America, the military of the United States of America. He comes to Israel to talk with your right. highest officials. This would have been inconceivable when I was born. So there, there has been change, but you know, there have been setbacks and tremendous setbacks. Um, and I think we have to be attentive to that. Um, one very shocking, you know, episode in American life in the past few years was what happened in Charlottesville, Virginia yes. a few years ago. And what I would say to people, that's right, attend to Charlottesville, Virginia. What were those neo-Nazis, what were those Klansmen saying? They were anti-Jewish, they were anti-Black, and that typically goes together. Yes. And one thing I, I mean, I simply do not, you know, when people, when, when people are bigots, bigotry is infectious. It's typically infectious. It, 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 go, it often goes together. And to get back to Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream, I think we need a big dose of that earnest, some would say sentimental, but fine, if it's sentimental, I'm sentimental. We are all human beings. We are all written down on the same list, and we have to be, all of us, wherever, bit against bigotry. If it's in our camp, we have to be against it. If it's in somebody else's camp, we have to be against it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's a, that's, that's a struggle in America now, and, you know, that's what we're dealing with. But what did you think just about the whole like backlash in terms of what I said, policies that were actually implemented in terms of uh, there was police forces that cut down on their budgets and uh, and, yeah. the... you know, Black Lives Matter. It did black. The Black Lives Matter movement uh, did do something very important and I think very good. It put the problem of police misconduct on the front pages yes. of, of the newspapers 
It made it a priority for a brief moment in American life. That was a good thing because in America, we do have a problem with uh, police uh, brutality, police misconduct. The police in America are not uh, monitored as they should be. So, you know, so I'm glad that Black Lives Matter pushed that. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, Black Lives Matter, in my view, um, uh, sort of went off in a bad direction when it started talking about things like abolish the police. Yeah. How in the world are you going to have, I mean, there are 300 million people in the United States of America. <laughs> 300 million. Right. The United States of America is a huge country. Think, you know, think about Manhattan. And that's just one place. Manhattan. What? You're not going to you, you, try living in Manhattan without the police. <laughs> Any civilized society is going to need police. You mm -hmm. need good policing. And so, you know, this abolish the police that was ridiculous. Abolish prisons. Some people need to be in prison for right. goodness sakes. Uh, so there was a certain sort of extravagant, uh, you know, sort of people just outdoing themselves to uh, be radical. And I yeah. think that that squandered a good amount of energy and squandered a good amount of, uh, of ill will. Defund the police. No, I, frankly, frankly. The police are a very important utility. Um, if I was in charge, I'd pour more resources to Make the them better. I'd pay them more. I'd have more of them. And I would say, okay, fine, we're going to pay you more. We're going to have more of you. We, we expect excellence yes. in the police. It seems to me that that should have been the... The way yeah. the people went. The police reforms should have been actually reforming the way it's done and not destroying the whole thing. Absolutely. Bringing down the system. I guess Absolutely. I think that's the, the discussion be in America too. Should we tear down the system or should we make the system better? I think that's a lot of where we're going in, a lot, in the whole Western world. And also on the left and also on the right, you have that. Unfortunately, I mean, again, I'm, remember, I mean, I, you know, I'm talking to you from, you know, from, from Harvard Law School. Yeah. In some quarters, the very term reform yes. became a bad word. You know, you are a mere reformist. People would you know, <laughs> sort of say that with disdain. And, you know, I, I thought that that was, that was really unfortunate because, like I said, there was a lot of goodwill. And you know how things are. The, you know, the, the, the citizenry is only... You know, people's attention span is exactly. only so long. Especially now with the cell phones yeah. and the internet and Absolutely. everything. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And so you only have a small window in order in, in, in which to, to build on something. And there was a, 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 a good bit of squandering of yes. goodwill. Um, I, I know we have to finish. I'll just say that I want to, hopefully we could do this again about something else that you mentioned that I wanted to maybe invite you on again. Cause it was, I think it's, I don't agree with a lot of what you said, but I think it's good to listen to you because first of all, it's, it's interesting to listen to you. That's number one. But number two, I think it's good to listen to people with different opinions. Mm -hmm. And even though some of my listeners might get angry at you, you know, we're here in Israel, you were saying you have different, um, disagreements with our government that's fine we're talking we're having a discussion um we're both coming from a good faith place and i think that's where a lot of now especially now with the echo chamber we all talk with ourselves so i think first of all thank you so much for coming i would also just add something that i thought was interesting about martin luther king and the whole civil rights movement you mentioned that bigots usually start off either with the blacks or then with the Jews or vice versa, but they always come to where both the groups are always somehow linked together. And I would say that during the, in the civil rights movement, the Jewish community with Martin Luther King, Rabbi Heschel, and a lot of the religious leadership of the Jews, it's a very, for people who don't know, I know there's now a lot of disconnecting between blacks and Jews in America and different, you see it in some of the polls. I think people should read about what 
the Martin Luther King's Jewish friends, and how they helped him on the marches. And it's a very critical moment in history that just to understand how our two groups were able to come together for such an important cause. And I hope that we are able to keep this dialogue, to, you know, me and you especially, but just in general. I would like I would like that very much, just to pick up on your last point. The probably the, the, the two most important lawyers in the civil rights era, you say, let's say 1945 to 1970, if you were going to ask who were the two most important lawyers uh, advancing the struggle for racial justice during that period, there would be two people who would rise to the top. One, the great Thurgood Marshall. Mr. Civil Rights, first black uh, person on the Supreme Court of the United States. Yeah. The second would be Thurgood Marshall's successor, successor at the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. What was that man's name? Jack Greenberg. <laughs> no, Jack Greenberg. No, but I, 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 I was thinking of an African-American name and he's a Greenberg. <laughs> G, Jack Greenberg. I remember when I went to law school. And I was, you know, taking constitutional law, and I was particularly interested in the civil rights cases. I'd be reading through all these cases, and I'd always see Jack Greenberg. Jack Greenberg, who is this guy? And fortunately, I had the great good fortune of actually working for Jack Greenberg at the NAACP Legal Defense Fund after my first year of law school. And it was the most important thing that I did professionally during my law school years, but Jack Greenberg, an American Jew, extremely important, extremely yeah. devoted, and not just him. One could go, you know, with a, a, a long list. Yeah. And I do think, unfortunately, that, you know, people have forgotten, people just, you know, pe there's a lot of ignorance, and we have to fight yes. ignorance. Exactly. And that's one of the reasons why we need conversations like this. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. Thanks so much for having me on. Professor Randall Kennedy, I appreciate it. And um, I, b before you go, I want to tell you that it was, it was enlightening, and we will do this again, hopefully. And so thank you so much. Thank you so much for our audience and our listeners and our podcast watchers. So I thank you, and um, subscribe, et cetera, et cetera. We'll see you on our next episode.